We're in America, Cy. Give me five. Boom! After 25 years of biking around the world, the time has come for our most epic journey yet. Dude, we're on our way. Route 66, America's Main Street. Over 2,000 miles of historic tarmac stretching from Chicago to LA. It's another Route 66 icon. This is a food odyssey through the heart of this great nation. Oh, wow. Yabba dabba doo. From the tea till kiss it. In search of the real American tastes, flavors, and dishes. Cowboy beans. Look at that. That's extraordinary. To discover these dishes, we'll journey east to west through nine states, finishing on the Pacific coast of California. Look at that, buddy. Is that the best? It's a journey through America's modern history. This road is nearly 100 years old now. It's like stepping back in time. And a chance to look into its future. We come in peace. We'll ride across great plains, vast deserts, and through must-see cities and small-town communities. In Navajo culture, you know, once you guys come here, you guys will actually be living as family. Meeting the incredible people who populate this iconic route. Welcome to Mama's Gonna Be Kitchen! This is set to be the ride of a lifetime. <laughs> Look at that, dude. Bon voyage. Sai, are you ready for our next adventure? I'm always ready, especially when it comes to Route 66. Starting in Amarillo, we're riding 400 miles through the northern tip of Texas, known as the Panhandle. And the state of New Mexico, to finish our journey in Albuquerque. When we set off on this journey, we knew we would pass endless chain restaurants and big-name brands, as that's what we expect in America. But our next stretch of Route 66 books that trend and is renowned for small, independently-owned restaurants and food producers, places that have achieved special recognition. Our first stop is the largest city in the Panhandle, Amarillo. Amarillo is one of the fastest growing cities in the US. It also has a strong connection with Route 66 as it crosses the city from east to west. The mother road is taking us to the Golden Light Cafe, a very special place. It's the only original Route 66 burger joint still open. Some say they are the best burgers on the whole road. And it's a place of national significance. This property has been placed on the National Register of Historic Places by the United States Department of the Interior. So it's like a cultural equivalent of a blue plaque. So it's like if Wimpy... Yes. ..had a national Mr. trust... Mr Wimpy. Oh, yeah, Mr Wimpy had a national trust plaque going, this is important culturally to the UK and part of UK history. Yeah, like, this is the first one on the A1 in Britain. Yeah. But this is Route 66. Well, yeah. And, and it's a real old place, and it's so important to the community. Well, that's good. Shall we? Uh, well, yes. What are you ordering? Let's have a look. It'll be a burger. Not only is it a national institution, its owner, Angela, decided to make it her life's work. What made you buy this place? here all through college and I was afraid someone else was going to change it and I knew the owner was going to sell it and so I kind of bought it on a whim. It wasn't a planned thing. Did you? Uh, so I straight did. from college you bought it? Straight from place. college, yes. Yes sir, yeah. So and I've, I've worked here for 20 years. Yeah, your parents said to you at college, do you know what, study hard or you'll end up selling burgers. I know, that's what I always joke about. I have a master's degree and I'm flipping burgers. It's a great place. It, it, it sort of smacks of, I don't know, just, just lots and lots of good food and community here. Yes, it is. It's, I would say we're pretty much 90% regular people that come here every day. And what, why is that important to you? I think it's because this is kind of one of the only places left that's part of the history of Route 66. It hasn't changed. And so that, you know, it's, it's people love it. They come here to be part of the past, you know, because it's still, it's the same as it was. I mean, it's not, it doesn't change that much. 
It's not just the history that Angela's keen to protect, it's also the cafe's unique connection to its customers. Well, their burgers are named after people that, in fact, the Corbin's Harley burger, this gentleman down here is Dr. Corbin, and that's his burger. In the blue. Oh, wow. Yeah. Here, you can build your own burger, and if you become a regular, your burger may even end up on the menu, like Dr. Corbin, who's been coming here for decades. Dr. Corbin? Yes. Where's that? The Harley Burger, Corbin's Harley Burger. All oh, right, Corbin. Right there, the very first one. It's one of our most popular ones. Have you seen? Does he have that every time he comes in? Yes, but he adds bacon on it. Ah, oh, does he? Uh, he adds my bacon because I'm the bacon burger, so we always joke about it. We also have a really, really good patty melt. Have you ever had a patty melt? I'll have a patty's melt because I've never melt? had one, and then it's like, all right, okay. I'll, I'll still go for Ar Aaron's Habanero Burger. Okay. Angela's burgers are exceptional thanks to two things: great produce and the cafe's 70-year-old grill that's seasoned to perfection. All right, oh, guys, here we go. Here we go. Here is our chili cheese bacon fries. Look at Wow. Wow. And our your patty melt. Patty melt. Ooh. This is great. Thank yes. you very much. The patty melt uses sourdough toasted bread instead of the more traditional brioche bun. Look at that. That's a very fine-looking burger. Uh -huh. Ooh, the habaneros. It's hot, and it's got a kick, doesn't it? Woohoo! Yes. I think it's so great, so important that a young person like yourself <laughs> is taking care of the Route 66 traditions and the proper businesses. It's a little bit of the real America that a foreigner will hope to find. Do we have? Oh, good. I'm so glad. Yeah, I know we have, definitely. Good. Brilliant. There's still some of us little places left, I think. Brilliant. Do you think the future of the American dream is big national corporations or places like yours? I hope it's places like mine. I don't know. You know so do I, we. I, I, yeah, hope, we I hope it's places like this. That's, so do that's, we. They're the, I mean, I think that's why we're so popular. People must still like them. What a treat. We were promised real independent food on this stretch, and this cafe is definitely our first taste of that. Individuality seems to be the name of the game on this stretch of Route 66. On the outskirts of the city is an iconic destination where you can really express yourself. The Cadillac Ranch was created in 1974 by the Ant Farm, an avant-garde architecture and graphics art collective. They often made use of popular American icons in their installations, in this case, Cadillacs. Well, I have to say, we've been to some ranches in the past, but we've never been to a ranch that grows Cadillacs. Do you know what? This is on my bucket list. I've always wanted to come here, and here we are. Look at it. Do you know what kind of symbolises what we want to find on Route 66? It's arty, it's a bit mystical. Above all, it's bonkers. Cadillacs used to be a symbol of wealth in the States, celebrating the idea of an economy built on big brands. But here, by literally placing the cars on their heads and allowing visitors to spray paint them, the artists were trying to subvert the big brands and allow individuals to express themselves. And do you know they're planted at the exact angle of the sides of the Great Pyramid in Egypt at Giza? Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. But I'll tell you what I did know. These are a legacy left by an art movement. We want people to, well, touch them. It's interactive. Do you mean we get to leave our mark? We do. Come on, then. Let's go. It's messy. It's, it's, it's wet. <laughs> It's Texas, it's meant to be hot, dry and arid. Now it's our turn to leave our marks and show our rebellious creativity. For posterity. Until the next person turns up and leaves their mark. Amarillo is also the location where Route 66 was bypassed by the new interstate called I-40 when it opened in the 60s. Like in many other places along Route 66, when the traffic died, so did most of the businesses. But here, one business had the foresight to act fast and move location to survive. The Big Texan, founded on Route 66 by a gentleman called Bobby Lee Sr., who had a vision nearly 60 years ago. To create the perfect cowboy-themed food emporium.
Every year, his creation sees more than half a million tourists come through its doors. Including us, as we've been invited to meet brothers who are keeping their dad's vision alive. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers, right. gentlemen. There's a responsibility that goes with it because we see second and third generations families from all over the world driving through the Texas Panhandle. And like I said, if they come in here for the Roford salad dressing, what happened to your salad dressing? What happened to your barbecue sauce? I mean, we have a responsibility to be open 365 days a year, no matter what. We have a responsibility on our recipes, like my dad started in 1960, so we take it personal, and it's very important because that's, that's why the people come back. But for the family, everything could have been lost overnight. You know what? When I-40 opened up, Route 66 the next day in 1968, overnight, gone. Overnight, gone. Really? Gone forever, business, yeah. My dad said he would remember it until the day he died, and that business went to zero overnight. Wow. Yeah. Determined to protect it, he moved the whole operation five miles down the road next to the new interstate, where it remains to this day 50 years later. Before I-40 was even here, my dad would sell beer out here on Sundays. And so the idea was born when I-40 moved over here to move the restaurant from Route 66. And that's where we get our roots for Route, Route 66. Wow, what a shrewd move that was by your, by your dad. Through. So was it always a foregone conclusion that the brothers, you're going to the family business here, that this is what you'd end up doing? No, because we both, we both tried getting out of this business. We wanted nothing more than do with it because we grew up in it. Sure. But once we got away from it and started looking back, maybe my dad wasn't such a big dumbass after all, that it was actually something that, that he understood way before his time. The cowboy never goes out of style, right? Is that what that yeah, always sure. said? He always said that, guys. The cowboy never goes yeah. out of style. Sure. And that's the magic of the big Texan. Cheers. Cheers man. And the magic also comes from their home-brewed beers made on site by beer master Tom. It's even been named as one of the top ten places to drink beer in the world. It's a microbrewery that produces exclusively for the big Texans' customers. Today, that's us. Do you know, Tom, it's so funny. Up there, you, you see the magnificence of the bar and taste the magnificent beer. But this is where it all happens. You haven't got much space, have you? Not much space. Uh, very small batches and interesting equipment this is yes. not the, this is not the usual equipment by any means but we embrace the redneck version of our of our brewery you know we we made it to work and uh, i can do such small batches and that, that way i can tweak each recipe to just exactly what i so want it's proper artisan brewing it's it is exactly artisan craft beer is one of the new ideas for the big texan it's Martin and Bobby Lee's creativity that is now keeping their dad's vision at the top of its game. A new day, and we're heading west towards New Mexico. But we can't leave Texas without a visit to one of its most incredible landscapes, Palo Duro Canyon, known as Texas's Grand Canyon. Unlike the Grand Canyon, there's not a tourist in sight. We've come here as it's a brilliant spot for us to cook the national dish of Texas. And no, it isn't a giant steak. In a cavern by a canyon, excavated for some chili. Texas chili. That's it? That's it. I can't come to Texas not cook chili. Wait, it's wrong. the state capital dish. Look where we are. Palo Duro means hardwood in Spanish and refers to the hardwood shrubs and trees found here. The canyon is a standing witness to Wild West history. It saw many battles during the Red River War that pushed the Native Americans out of the Texas Panhandle and made way for the cattle ranch era. We're going to be doing our Texas chili. It's really kind of spicy. We've got some interesting ingredients like coffee and stout. It's a brilliant chili recipe. And we're going to be making some handmade flatbreads served with like a coriander butter. Now, to start off, we're going to brown the meat off. We're going to start with some beef dripping or lard. 
we're using big chunks of braising steak. Here, they call it chuck steak. So, then we add salt and a little bit of pepper. Always season the meat before it starts cooking. And I'm slicing two good-sized onions. Again, I'm going to use lard to sweat the onions down, but you could use your oil of choice. Now, in Texas, chili is a really serious business. I found this on the internet. Anyway, chili con carne is the official dish of the US state of Texas as designated by the House Concurrent Resolution Number 18 of the 65th Texas Legislature during its regular session in 1977. There is no mucking around with chili in these parts. For the fiery furnace that is the chili in the chili, we're going to be using jalapeno chilies, good chili powder, and smoked chili powder, like a habanero. As much as we love spicy food in the UK, I've got to say here, they put chilli in flipping everything. Which is good news, as it's a great anti-inflammatory, natural pain relief, and good for your heart and blood pressure. And chilli is a fruit, you know, which counts as part of your five a day. I love it. The literal translation of chilli con carne is, guess what? Chilli with meat. See? Chilli con with Carney, meat. And Texans have been making chili since 1850 because, you see, they found out they could get the beef, the suet, the chilies, and dry it all into a brick, which meant when you were out on the range, you'd rehydrate your block of chili, and bingo, you've got chili. It's 1850. Brilliant, man. I love chili. In addition to the chopped chilies, I want five cloves of chopped garlic. Now, we're using chuck steak in, in big chunks. It will break down. But really, you can use whatever meat you want. And for my money, there's nothing wrong with using mince. No. And, like, a couple of packs of mince will work really well with this chilli too. Absolutely. With the meat cooked, let's start building the flavour in our chilli pot. A tablespoon of coriander. A tablespoon of ground cumin. A tablespoon of dried oregano, or oregano, as they call it in these parts. Some cinnamon. Now, Kingy, how hot are we going to go with the chilli powder? Medium. So two, maybe? Yeah. So, uh, I want to, well, yeah, that'll do. Now, for added flavour, look at that. It's beautiful stuff. It's a smoked habanero chilli. That's beautiful. Just one of those to give it a lovely smoky quality. We want two tablespoons of tomato paste, two tablespoons of brown sugar. Nice. Right, <laughs> now the liquid. Pretty obvious, really, a can of tomatoes. We've learnt a few tricks along the way on Route 66. We've learnt a few things about chilli in Texas. We put in 100 ml of cold coffee. Fresh brewed coffee, real coffee, and that goes in. The coffee not only adds a greater depth of flavour, it also helps to tenderise the meat. This is our secret weapon. Do you remember last night when we were in the Big Texan? Most wonderful beer. Anyway, they sold us a growler of their whiskey barrel stout. So, we want about a pint, 500 ml. Oh. Yes. Chili con carne needs to cook a long time, hence the importance of adding a lot of liquid. The stout will also bring some sweetness to the spicy chili. Then the meat goes in, and we stew it for a good hour before adding the beans. Well, this hour of simmering gives us time to prepare the dough for our flatbreads, which are going to cook fresh, which is going to be divine. It's a simple dough. Strong white flour, baking powder, salt, and some dried thyme for flavour. And now we've got sun-blushed or sun-drenched tomatoes. Now, the difference between sun-dried and sun-blushed is that sun-dried are more dehydrated than sun-blushed. These have got a bit of hoo hoo So you want to use hoo hoo as opposed to <laughs> Tomatoes and a glug of olive oil bring sweetness to the bread and balances the heat of the chilli. Now, for the liquid in this, you can use either milk or water. But well, we're using milk, cos we can. we we'll just keep working this in, and eventually we'll make a dough. While the dough is resting, we can add the beans to the chilli. And we've got a mixture of pinto, which are very traditional, and kidney beans. Now, we put the beans in, and they're going to cook down for a further hour or two. While everything is simmering, we deserve a rest and a good old Texan cup of coffee. Mm. 
With our chilli nearly ready, we can get our flatbreads on the go. We roll out small balls of dough and fry them gently for a couple of minutes in a medium hot shallow oil. To finish the flatbreads, we're using coriander butter. Oh, put that over there. I can oh. see a plan coming together. <laughs> there we have it. Texas chili con carne served with delicious sun-blushed tomato flatbread. And don't forget, you can leave the meat out and make this veggie. It's also great served with rice. We're back on Route 66 and just a few miles from a real milestone on our journey. Our next stop is a town called Adrian. It's a pretty special place, as it's known as the Midpoint. We are literally halfway between Chicago and LA. Come on, Dave, let's have a selfie. At this point, there are two options. The new modern freeway, or running parallel to it, the original Route 66, which is what we're doing, of course. It's not long before we see the impact the new road has had on the towns that were bypassed. You know, I don't think I've ever seen a ghost town before. No, same. It makes it evident that the big Texan success back in Amarillo is an exception. Around here, it's not just the independent businesses that have disappeared, it's whole towns. But it's so funny, is it, because Glen Rio, it's signposted from interstate. Well, that's the mad thing. It's, yeah, as you see, it's signposted from the interstate. But to what? But to what? Nothing. This really is one of the tragedies of Route 66. I mean, Glen Rio was a thriving town, and it's been here since before Route 66. It was on the Ozark Trail, which became part of Route 66. But now it's just gone, killed by the, the highway. After 65 years of existence, it took only 30 days for the town to die once the I-40 was open. Glen Rio had it all. First, the motels, gas station and restaurants went, and then the people followed. Now it's all gone. Look at that. And, I mean, the thing is, although Route 66 was, you know, the American dream in that movement west for, you know, better jobs and more money. It's also a highway of broken dreams as well, isn't it? It is. Crazy. Progress has come at a price in this part of the world. Look at that, mate. The interstate is just there. Now on the I-40, running parallel to Route 66, we are entering New Mexico. According to the guidebooks, things should be on the up on this side of the border, with independent and small producers' numbers growing steadily. I'm looking forward to discovering the wonders of this state. Me too, mate. New Mexico was named by Spanish settlers after an Aztec valley, more than 250 years before Mexico, the country, even existed. Here, an eclectic mix of cultures have settled, leaving a rich and varied heritage. The original Route 66 doesn't exist anymore in many places around here, so we're sticking with the I-40 for over 100 miles to reach our next stop. Our destination is the small town of Moriarty, a close-knit farming community where some small producers are embracing going back to basics. We're stopping here to meet the lovely Schwebachs. Dean and his family are running a one-of-a-kind farm in the area. While most of their neighbouring farmers are selling their crops to the big corporates, the Schwebachs have chosen to cater for their local community. Using their farm shop and food trucks, and of course their produce, the family is keen to put people back in touch with where food comes from. Hello. 
What a welcome. What a welcome. It's brilliant, mate. It's lovely. You guys want to come out back and take a look at the place? We'd love to. Too, yeah. yeah, should we have a wander? Yeah. Oh, that'd be nice. Um, How was your ride? Well, it was. it's good to have a walk, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Dean and his family are looking after 160 hectares of land. That's well over 200 football pitches, growing corn, chilli and many other varieties of fruit and vegetables. Oh. It's, it's just saying that the whole family involved in the farm, because of all the, the, the younger members of the family, the homeschooled as well. Yes. Why, why yes, is yeah. that? Why did you elect to do that? Um, we really feel like God's given us that um, opportunity yes. to raise our children and it works very well with farming because of the seasons. And so our, our school calendar is a lot different than the public school calendar. They'll spend most of the harvest time um, not schooling or just doing one subject through the summertime and into harvest, and then we'll pick back up again. Dominic, do, do, you, love, do you love the harvest time? Yes, sir. It's a good fun. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite thing to do on the farm, Dominic? Drive tractors. <laughs> We've been invited to taste the product of their labour, and lucky us, we can even join in the preparation. And first, we're roasting some homegrown chilies. And so this is very traditional. All over the state, this is what you're going to find. This Everyone is, is getting their chilli so they can put it up for the winter months. Once roasted, the chilies are ready to be frozen so they can be eaten all year round. I've been asked to help at the family's other business, its food truck, run by two of their children, Nathan and Alicia, serving up the best of the family's produce. How cool is it to have a family food truck? It's it's really fun. It is. Um, I, I've always loved creating, and um, I don't know that my family's always loved it. There's always been... Yeah. You know, mistakes, but it's it's a fun experience. Alicia is cooking corn-based pancakes. Uh, already in the batter is bacon and Chico corn flour. Um, What's Chico corn flour? So it's our sweet corn that we've yeah. um, dried and smoked, actually. So that's yours as well, all yes. from the farm? Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. So it has a very unique smoky flavour. What are you going to be cooking, Nathan? <laughs> I'll be cooking green chili chicken enchiladas and actually making the green chili from scratch. So that's something we can do at yeah. home. Butter on the griddle. I here. must say, your food truck is better than most commercial kitchens I've ever been in. <laughs> it's pretty good. It, it gets very hot and very narrow sometimes, but. How's the pancakes? I think, I think this one's probably getting close. Mm. Oh, the pancakes are stacking up, and I can't wait to taste them. Same here. And with the chilli roasting nicely, I'm finding out more about the Schwebachs. You're a Los Angeles girl, aren't you? you Los you, Angeles you, and then Albuquerque. And then Albuquerque, so mm -hmm. a city girl. Yes. Oh, that's a big adjustment. How did you make that adjustment? Did you just you just roll your sleeves up and get stuck in? or? Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> so I came out crying, but have <laughs> come to love being here. Um, I knew that it was a passion for him sure. and that it was something he wanted to do, so yeah. I wanted to support that. And once we started working together and I had my children alongside and we're walking down the field or I'm watching them play in the field, um, it just continues to, it's something that continues to grow. It's about time together. It's, it's time... Um, thanking God for what he's created. Yes. And communicating that with our children. We're losing touch with the land yes. and with family farms. And so many children have no idea. And so we want them to have the same excitement that I have mm -hmm. when I look out in the field and the corn is coming out of the field and it's this big and it's it's really an amazing thing to be a part of. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really a, a blessed life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not an easy one. Mm -hmm and we have hailstorms that we could tell you stories about, but at the end of the day, it's really a, a wonderful life that we're able to live, and we're very thankful um, for that. Very keen to involve the locals. Aside from their farm shop, the family also offer a community-supported agriculture scheme, or CSA. Locals pay a fee in exchange for a weekly box of fresh produce. Good harvest means good food for the whole community.
While Alicia is flipping more savoury and sweet pancakes, Nathan's Maison Place is ready. Around here, chilli is served with most dishes, and the question is not just about heat, but more about colour and flavour. Like, the big question in New Mexico is red, green, or Christmas. Are you red or green? I'm Christmas. green. You're green. I'm green. I think I'm I really am too, green. actually. Yes. Yes, there is a third option, Christmas. The combination of the red and the green. Yes, sir. Big Jim's. Which Big is gyms. the most common variety of green chili oh. in New Mexico. Do you yeah. think in New Mexico, are you, are you kind of chili obsessed? I would say so, yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We have chili on just about everything. Well, do you two cook well together? <laughs> Uh, sometimes we do, but so most of the time we don't. It's, really? <laughs> yes, we, uh, we have differing ways of cooking. I yeah. tend to be more precise. She tends to be a little bit more... Uh, well, she knows how to estimate things really well. Right. So, Just kind of throw it in. Yeah. <laughs> and so, it drives him crazy, and it drives me crazy that he's measuring very accurately, so... Do you know, I, I can hear echoes of my own working life, too. <laughs> Dave, are you trying to say I drive you crazy when we're cooking? No, I'm saying I like being accurate. And what I'm really saying is that with Alicia's pancakes and Nathan's chili chicken enchiladas warm and good to go, we're ready to join you guys. Oh, look at the colour coming across here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the, the, the sauce from the pepper. Well, the pancakes. Have you ever seen more perfect pancakes? No. They're the savoury and the sweet. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, thank you, guys. You've, yeah. you've been a hard at work here, eh? The food is plentiful, and the diversity of recipes really embrace the new Mexico flavours. But most of all, the ingredients really celebrate the family's achievements, sustainable farming to create great produce. Thank you so very much indeed. Thank you. The farm shop and the food truck are the perfect example of how successful a cottage industry can be. Bigger doesn't always mean better. Leaving the town of Moriarty and the Schwebachs farm behind us, we're moving north to Santa Fe for our next stop. Santa Fe isn't technically on Route 66, but it used to be. It's a curious tale of a very disgruntled governor who took his frustration out on the electorate of Santa Fe for not being voted into office. Before leaving his office, said governor created a new portion of the road, literally cutting off Santa Fe from Route 66. Well, anyway, there's no disgruntled politician going to put us off, is there, Si? Absolutely not, mate, no. What a wonderful town. It is, it is. Santa Fe is the highest capital in the States and a superb cosmopolitan city where the architecture and culture still derives from its Mexican and Spanish empire days. It's also known for its plethora of independent producers and artisans. If you're a foodie, it's the place to go. One of the most iconic landmarks in the city is its railway station, a memory of when the Santa Fe Railway Company ruled this part of the world. It's also the home of a weekly farmer's market. It's a fitting location for two hungry bikers to cook a homage to Santa Fe's Mexican heritage. Woohoo! Casey Jones steaming and rolling. Santa Fe Railway. I oh, know, this is iconic. It's brilliant now. Who'd have thunked it, eh? We're cooking carnitas, which are little chunks of meat served with smoked chipotle mac and cheese. Now, this locally is known as a Boston butt. Now, a Boston butt is not what you're thinking. It's actually a cheap shoulder cut of pork. The Americans love a dry rub. You know when you do a marinade, it's basically, well, they would call it a wet rub. But it's dry ingredients that come together, which I'm going to assemble, and Kingy is going to roll his Boston butt in the dry ingredients, that's stage one. Sweet. Also, with a dry rub, we can get the beautifully caramelised crust we're looking for during cooking. I want two teaspoons of cumin, one teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of dried oregano, one teaspoon of mustard powder. Good old English mustard would be good for this. 
one teaspoon of smoked paprika, one teaspoon of cinnamon, one teaspoon of thyme, one teaspoon of garlic powder, and finally one tablespoon of soft brown sugar. When making the rub, do a big batch, as it can keep for several months in your spice cupboard. And these are the size of chunks that you kind of need. Dave's beautifully prepared rub. And then all we do is massage until they're lovely and evenly coated. While Sai is browning the meat, I'm starting the mac and cheese by adding half an onion, a bay leaf, cloves, and allspice berries to a litre of milk. Bring that up to the boil, let it go cold, and you'll have the most wonderful kind of spicy flavoured milk for making your cheese sauce for your macaroni cheese. Mm. To the meat, we're adding garlic, lime and orange juice. Oh, look, all of those lovely yeah. citric acid juices yeah. have just deglazed the pan. But now, the cola. It's interesting, the cola they make in America is made with corn syrup. You need the cola that's made from cane sugar. So we've actually taken the trouble to buy Mexican cola because it's made with cane sugar. Now, the cola that you get in the UK is also made with cane sugar, so you're fine. What this does, it, it tenderises the meat. And when reduced, the cane sugar helps with the fruit juice's caramelisation. And lastly, good chicken stock. That's got a lovely rumble on now. Then we use a piece of greaseproof paper called a cartouche under the lid to seal the pot and we let it simmer gently. Right. Macaroni cheese. So first off, I've got 75 grams of butter which I'm going to melt into a pan. And my friend is going to chop an onion for me to put in with the butter. I'm going to chop some garlic. Then I'm going to add some flour, a pinch of dried thyme and a glass of white wine. And to start building the white sauce, I'm sieving the infused milk into the pan. Yeah, just keep it coming. Ladle by ladle of the most perfect spicy milk. Oh, look at that. Just cut that till it thickens. Now, the chicken stock. Now, the secret weapon is smoked chipotle. Chipotle chilies are, in fact, smoke dried jalapeno chilies. They're really hot. They're really smoky. They're fabulous. There's a driver. Well, why do I always wave at trains? I've always done that since I saw the railway children. Beautiful. Time for the cheese. Toss away. Next, it's the smoked chipotle chilies that are added to the sauce. Look at this. And finally, the pre-cooked macaroni pasta. That consistency is perfect. But we need to bake this in the oven now with a cheesy topping. Now, I'm going to put this into an oven, preheated, 180 degrees, about 30 minutes, until it's heated through, golden and bubbly and lovely. Back to the carnitas. Great. Well, this should be... Let's have a look. Perfect. Ooh. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, Thanks, mate. Thank you very much. Now we start the crispification process. This is what makes it different to pulled pork. First, take the meat out of the sauce and shred it roughly. Then, refry it in a flipping hot pan. As the meat starts getting that sought after crust, add a small teaspoon of sugar to help with the caramelization. You're going to be happy. Oh, yes. And that's our smoked chipotle mac and cheese. And our crispy carnitas. That's a fiesta of a feast. It flipping is. New Mexico, we love you. Yes, that's our tribute. Santa Fe. Get in. That governor made a big mistake to take Route 66 away from Santa Fe 
the city may have lost its tourist connection to the iconic road, but it seems to have done pretty well in its own right. If chilies are a big export from New Mexico, dairy is the biggest, and we're heading to the outskirts of Santa Fe to meet one of the best American cheese producers at the Dreamcatcher Dairy Farm. The secret of their success, making goat's cheese, that doesn't taste like goat's cheese. Hey, how are you? Hello, I'm good. Kiddos. How are you? <laughs> I'm nice great. Nice to see you. Welcome to the farm. Oh, you're very, it's very nice to be here. Hey. This is our Dave. Hello, Mario. Hello, Dave. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> how old? Uh, two, two and a half weeks, somewhere in there. Oh, I am gorgeous. Marianne is a celebrated cheesemaker, with people from all around the United States buying her unique products. To cater for her cheese production, she set up a unique organic free-range farm where the animals are treated more like family than livestock. There you go. And they love beards. It reminds them of their mom. <laughs> nice. So I'm a nanny. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> Marianne chose to care for Nubian goats, which originated from the Middle East and North Africa and are known for the quality of their milk. How big's the farm, Marianne? So the farm, um, the whole piece of property is 10 and a half acres. Right. But the girls are on about five acres. So the farm itself with the animals, it's about five acres. Now, every girl has a name. Yeah? Every girl, every buck has a name. Right. Okay? Yes. And when they're not this content, <laughs> they would normally come. So we're going to go to them yeah. because we're going to give them an animal cracker. Yeah. And you'll see how gentle they are. Oh. Actually, this is Gracie. Hello, Gracie. Hello, Gracie. And Gracie loves her cookies. They're beautiful. There's no stress in these animals whatsoever. No, they, they have room to be animals. We have to bring all of their food in. Oh. So I have no pasture land here in New Mexico in this part. Yeah. And it makes it very different. So I have c complete control over what they eat. Yes. And I think that's the difference that you're going to taste in the cheese. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Have you been involved in this all your life, Marianne? No, I've been a city girl until I came out here. Wow. Really? Yes. What did you do? Yeah, I was a financial planner for a long time. So, but I decided that I wanted to come out to New Mexico to be around livestock for my retirement. But honestly, I'm working more now than I did then. <laughs> that's your favorite again. Yeah. No, no, that's not my favorite. No, that, this no, no, is no. Gracie. Can you not tell one goat from another? That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> Mary Ann's goats are the happiest goats I have ever seen. But don't be deceived by their smiles. They hold a secret weapon. They produce a milk that has the highest butterfat content of any dairy goat, which is key to Mary Ann's renowned cheese. Oh, wow. well, look at that, that cheese. Isn't this wonderful? Yes, it is. First, Marianne is letting us taste her fresh goat's cheese. The freshness and high butterfat content means a really creamy cheese that doesn't taste like usual goat's cheese. Oh, it's much more delicate. Thank you. Oh, that's remarkable. We are tasting Marianne's feta two ways. First natural and then marinated in olive oil with thyme and rosemary. Uh, what we do is more of a European style. It's a creamier feta. What you find in the store is normally very hard and very dry. Yeah. Oh, that's superb. Mm. That, for me, is Greek feta. Feta is low in calories and fat and contains a high amount of B vitamins, phosphorus and calcium, which can benefit bone health. It's a lot of feta that, that, that you buy, it's overly salted. That's just flavour. It is. It's yeah. just... So, so this is the other thing. That's why I think we, our cheeses become so popular, yeah. is that I'm very attentive to what people are asking us to do. So many people have said to me, oh, my God, the feta is always so salty. And yes. we, can, we can control it, and we do. The other big seller from the farm is her Bulgarian probiotic yoghurt. Marianne, why do you call it, why do you call it uh, Bulgarian yogurt? Because it's actually a truly Bulgarian culture. I, mm -hmm. It's imported. Oh, OK. I tried an American culture that says Bulgarian, and the quality is just not there. So okay. it's mm -hmm. all in the taste. By culture, Marianne means the bacteria that turns the milk into yogurt. So I want you to know, when you taste this, it's so pure. It's the goat milk yeah. and the culture. There's nothing else added to this that would interfere with taste. And Bulgarian 
culture makes the yogurt just a little bit more on the on okay. the tart side, just right. so you know. Beautiful. But this thank you. The one of the reasons we make this is Bulgarian culture is the highest probiotic that wow. you can get. So good for your tummy? Everything. Yeah. Good yes. for your blood. Brilliant. Mm. This is the good stuff, mate. It's the Rolls Royce of friendly bacteria for your guts. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful stuff. Lovely, nicely acidic. Mm. Just creamy. Great. It's just great. All the love and care Marianne has for her goats is really reflected in her amazing cheese. And love and care is exactly what we've been promised at our next stop. It's not only the architecture that has been influenced by Spanish rule. When the Spanish Empire spread up here from South America, it brought with it cacao beans. Which made Santa Fe the first US city to manufacture chocolate, and that has left a very sweet impression on the place. We've been invited to discover the art of chocolate at Cacao Santa Fe, an award-winning duo of artisan chocolatiers. Hello. Can Hello. you smell the chocolate? Yeah, no, no, Mary. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you? Good. Hi. Melanie and Derek have been operating in Santa Fe for the last three years. They are passionate chocolatiers who decided to work only with small batches of the best ingredients to create the perfect chocolate. Cacao, what I always like to remind people, is a fruit. It's a tropical fruit. Right. And we don't often think of chocolate as a fruit. No, we don't. We don't. So it is the seeds of this fruit that we're going to make chocolate from. Right. And here is what this pod is going to look like when we open it up. We're going to have the uh, rind, which is thick, yep. like a pumpkin. And inside are 25 to 50 seeds. Mm -hmm. It takes approximately one pod to make one bar of chocolate. The beans are sourced for specific flavor characteristics and take an average of three days to process. It's a labor of love that you'll only find with a small business like this one. I think it's, it's with the artisan producers and craftspeople that we are finding the, the, the special parts are well away from the homogenized side that one thinks of Americana, you know? There's a lot of respect for people doing things well. Yeah. A lot of uh, celebrating the farmer, celebrating the maker, celebrating the chef. Really trying to bring those uh, flavors out so that people can enjoy their food and know where it came from. Grinding the beans for 72 hours really develops the flavor of the chocolate. This is hard work. Making chocolate really is an art. Mm. Wow. That's chocolate without sugar. Oh, my mouth. And this is how it tastes again. As we said, this is a three-day process. This is only eight hours into the process. Hence that tart astringency. But it's paralyzed my mouth. The next bit of the process is called tempering. This binds the chocolate crystals together to give it a good snap and a shiny finish. Derek, I mean, you're very, very particular. Do you think you've ever made the perfect bar? Are you constantly searching? Um, the perfect bar. I'm still in search of the perfect bar. <laughs> Laying it out. Mate, it looks like we've made chocolate. Yeah, this is a this is a plethora of chocolate gorgeousness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> listen. Oh, boy, that was crisp. Mmm, good mm. fragrance. Mmm, oh, it's silky. Mmm, mm. that's great chocolate. That is great chocolate. Mmm, mmm, I like the level of acidity to it as well. Mmm, really. Chocolate made its debut here close to 800 years ago. Right. Making it the first place in this hemisphere that chocolate was actually consumed. So in honor of that, we made what's called the Choco Bar. I'm never going to look at a bar of chocolate that's made by artisans in the same way no. ever again. Mexico has been full of surprises. Its rich heritage has led to a diverse collection of people and delicious food. I loved it. 
The end of our journey is in sight. For our last night, we're riding to the city of Albuquerque. Built over 200 years ago, Albuquerque is a lot larger than Santa Fe, but has inherited a very similar architectural style from the Spanish Empire. We made it, Kingy! Albuquerque, the end of the leg of this journey, and I'm quite sad. Yes, hasn't New Mexico been flipping amazing? Oh, it's been fantastic. I think we need to celebrate. Well, Dave, let's celebrate with a final cook. And I'm really inspired by our chocolate making. And by all the chilli around us. Chocolate and chilli, a perfect combination. I know of a local chilli farm that is very hospitable. Let's cook there. To embrace the flavours that we discovered in New Mexico, we're making a chilli and chocolate pie. We're due some desserts, aren't we? Yes, we are. And this is our just desserts. We've kind of invented a dessert that's like a masterpiece. And we're going to be using... Big Jim's chilies. The chocolate that we made. And we would be using the goat's cheese, but then it'd be a cheesecake. Yeah, and that'd be wrong. And cocoa wrong. nibs. Look so at those. We're going to make, like, a chilli chocolate mousse pie. It starts with the base and Oreo cookies, where I am going to place them in a bag and bash the living daylights out of them. And I'm melting some butter. Isn't this beautiful? The cotton trees. You see these trees here are all, like, kind of called cotton trees. Yeah. And, um, and they're just giving their little it's seedlings like off. It's no. beautiful. It even makes us look good, do you know what I mean? And then we add Dave's melted butter. So you pour the butter into the battered Oreos. You mix it. And then just... Yeah. Press them down with your hands. Because you don't want it to crumble when you're cutting a slice of this, do you? No. You want a nice tranche. Nice job. Now that's got to chill down, and we've got a fridge in the barn. Which is exactly where I'm going. And I'll get on with the salt caramel. OK. I'm melting a generous amount of butter with some brown sugar, around 50-50. Right, as you can see, the toffee's forming now. So, Kingy, can you put some salt in? And yeah. then we will have salt caramel. We'll let this cool a little bit. With the Oreo base set, we pour our caramel on top of it. And we're going to put this back in the fridge. It's not going to set solid, but we want it to have, like, a little bite to it. And into the fridge. Yep. For one topping, we're making some chilli praline, which is caramel with nuts in it. You can use any nuts. Today, we're using macadamias. Caster sugar. Now, this is golden organic caster sugar. The key to great praline and an even coloured praline is you've got to keep stirring it, and you stir it constantly. And it takes patience, this. And then it'll start to melt. Now, this is where we've got to keep an eye on it. Because what we need to do is we need to bring the sugar to a boil. To give our dessert a kick, we've roasted and rehydrated some of Big Jim's chilies. And I'm now going to use a spoonful of the chilli water for my praline. Now, be careful, because this will spit. Yeah. I'll go steady with it. OK, mate. Right, I'll keep stirring. Nice, great. Just keep that rolling. And then we're going to add our nuts. Just a couple of handfuls, maybe. Please, mate, yeah. That's great. Well, that is perfect. We're ready to build the chocolate layer. <laughs> the sun has given us a head start by melting Melody and Derek's chocolate bars. And I'm chopping some more chilies. And chilli and chocolate, the flavours go together so well. I mean, they're regional, but when we cook a chilli, we always put a couple of squares of really high cocoa solid dark chocolate into our meat chillies, and it just makes it really rich. It just adds a, that, that great depth of flavour yeah. as well. You can't get any purer than this, can you? We've seen this chocolate grow from bean to chocolate, and the chilli comes from that field. Right. Pretty cool. Now, we fold this into cream. So we put the chocolate in and the chilies, then we fold that in. Do you want me to hand? Yeah, go on, mate. We add broken bits of roasted cacao beans to give it a crunch. I'll go and get the okay, pie me. from the fridge. And look at it. It's set. And we load the chocolate, chilli, cocoa nib mousse 
on the top. I'll get this in the fridge. Let it rest for 30 minutes in the fridge and our cake will then be ready to decorate. Wow, that's come out a treat. Let's build you cream. I'll snap. Now, uh, because it's so hot, I'm having to work quite quickly. And obviously, you can put it back in the fridge and chill before serving. That's me, Dave. Right, right. so... Bit of shard support there. <laughs> oh, yes, lovely. Got the zest of lime, salt it in a sugar syrup, then dried it in the oven. And just sprinkle this over. Look at that. And this is our celebratory chili chocolate mousse pie with chili praline shards. New Mexico on a plate. We're spending the night in Albuquerque as tonight the town's baseball team is playing at home. And nothing says America like a ball game. It's got to be up the tops. Oh, right up the tops. Up the tops. Yeah. Is that what you say? Yeah. Oh, I'm so looking forward to this. There you go, baby. You got your own feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what the rules are? I mean, I've been to baseball games before, but I've still never got my head around the rules. Nah, it's like rounders, isn't it? But butch. For American families, going to the ball game is an occasion where they can celebrate their town and their local team. For us, it's a chance to reflect on the journey we've just made. Flip the neck. I mean, that's quick, dude. It's fast, isn't it? Oh, well, that's not good. It's a home run, isn't it? I mean, I have to say, Dave, I'm looking forward to Arizona, but I think what we found on this leg of Route 66 is some great producers. Yeah. Some people that love what they do, yeah. care about what they do, and it's been a very, very different vibe, quite homely, lots of hidden gems of great food. It has, and I think, as, as we go to New Mexico especially, it's got more cosmopolitan. Yes. It's more vibrant. The food's more exciting. Yes. This section of the route has really shown how America is more than just big brands. We've discovered the real US, populated by passionate people making wonderful produce. I want a trip to do with me, best mate. See him here, dude. Come here. Hey. Go <laughs> this is a landscape of a thousand Hollywood movies. Route 66 is taking us into the real Wild West. <laughs> We'll be cooking with the Navajo. Yes, yeah. thank you so very much. It's been such a special mm. day. Eating outstanding food. It's the best quesadilla I've ever tasted. Oh, it's really good. Mm. I'm meeting the man who saved Route 66. Thanks to what you did, we're sitting here now. Route 66 will never die. If you've got the money, she can help you walk on water. Sharing the wealthy world of Lillian Chu, million dollar wedding planner next. And you thought the MASH report was out of this world. Nish Kumar and the regulars with their take on all things topical, BBC Two at